Okay. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And I think it's three now, so we can start. Uh, are there any questions from last time? Uh, uh, okay, I have, I have one question about this game, but I, I promise I'll stop after this. But about yeah. the course, though. Uh, okay, okay. Never mind. <laughs> well, we can talk about the game after. <laughs> sure, sure. All right. Okay, so uh, let me pick up then where we left off. So I'll remind you that last time we introduced the notion of amenability. Uh, so uh, just recall that, uh, where, where did it go in here? This definition of von Neumann from 1929, that a group uh, is amenable or a group acting on a set is amenable uh, if there is a, a finitely additive uh, measure on this set, uh, probability measure, which is invariant under the group action. Or equivalently, there's an invariant state on L infinity of X, or equivalently, there's an invariant probability measure on the stone check compactification. These are all equivalent things. And uh, we finished last time by showing that uh, uh, ZD is amenable for LD. In fact, what we showed is a bit stronger. So I mentioned here, this is the terminology. So a group, uh, a group, so a Fulner, I wanted to find the Fulner sequence. Uh, so again, gamma, a group, a uh, Fulner sequence uh, or net. If the group is uncountable, maybe you want nets, uh, is a sequence of finite subsets f sub n uh, such that it has the property that if you look at the translate, the left translate of this finite subset and you look at the symmetric difference that this becomes very small relative to the size of the original set. So this goes to zero as n goes to infinity, and this is for all t and b. So that's the definition of a Fulner sequence. And what we actually proved here is that if a group has a Fulner sequence, then it's amenable. This is the only property we used about this set fn that we defined for the integers over here. So here's the example I gave you for the integers last time. And, uh, and whenever you have a Fulner sequence, uh, the group is amenable. Uh, there's another characterization. Actually, we did an intermediate step in this example, which is that uh, we could do this for finite subsets, or we could more generally do it for probability measures on the group. Um, so note, uh, so if, uh, actually, let, let me hold off. I don't want to name that. Uh, but okay, so we showed last time that ZD is amenable. The next remark I want to make is that amenability is a local property, meaning that if every finitely generated subgroup of a group is amenable, then the group itself is amenable. Uh, so the remark is that uh, if every uh, finitely generated subgroup of gamma is amenable, So then gamma is amenable. And why is this true? Well, it's pretty easy, uh, pretty easy to do. Uh, what we do is uh, for any finitely generated subgroup, gamma naught, we define a state say phi sub gamma naught on L infinity of gamma by phi uh, sub gamma naught uh, is just, we take phi, I guess I need a new, new notation. This is just C of gamma naught restrict, uh, sorry, 
phi sub gamma naught is phi sub gamma naught of a function f is c sub gamma naught restrict of uh, of f. I'm writing this very well of f restricted to l infinity of gamma naught. All right, that's what I meant to write. So by this, what I mean is, so this is where c sub gamma naught in l infinity of gamma naught dual is an invariant state. So by definition, any finitely, uh, or by hypothesis, any finitely generated subgroup is amenable, hence there exists such an invariant state. And so for each, uh, for each subgroup, I just define the state on L infinity of gamma uh, by just restricting a function to this subset, uh, to the subgroup, and then evaluating that corresponding state. Now, the thing to note here is, of course, this state I've defined is not gamma invariant, but it is gamma not invariant. Uh, so as you now let gamma not be larger and larger, finitely generated subgroups, this sequence of states you get, or this net of states, become more and more invariant. And so then what you can do is you can take a, an accumulation point, just like we did over here. So um, if phi is any accumulation point, so this is in the weak star topology, of this net of phi sub gamma naught, uh, such that gamma naught phi gamma is finally generated. So this is a net ordered by inclusion. Uh, and if we take any weak star accumulation point of this net, uh, so then phi is a gamma invariant state. And why is that? That's just because it'll be invariant under every finitely generated subgroup, hence it's invariant under the whole group. And so as a consequence of this, uh, we get that um, any free abelian group is amenable because it's finitely generated subgroups or uh, finitely generated free abelian groups, which we just proved right here, are amenable. Uh, the other remark is, let me call this one a proposition is that if gamma is amenable and we have a normal subgroup, so then the quotient is amenable. Uh, and why is this? This is just because the L infinity space of the quotient naturally embeds into the L infinity space of the larger in an equivariant way. So specifically, we can identify L infinity of the quotient, uh, or rather I should be precise and say we have a natural map from L infinity of the quotient, and this is given to L infinity of gamma which is just you view a function on the quotient as constant on right cosets. So these will be uh, sigma invariant. So this is sigma invariant. So by this notation, I mean this is the set of f in L infinity of gamma, such that f of t sigma is equal to f of t. So this is the action on the right here. This is invariance condition uh, for all uh, well, of course, it's normal subgroup, so right, same left. For all T and gamma, sigma and sigma. Uh, so we have this identification, in fact, between these two C star algebras. And this identification, uh, the gamma action over here becomes the quotient action over here. So gamma acts on both these spaces, and this is a gamma equivariant. Gamma acts on the left. Uh, so what does this mean? This means that therefore, so if we call this map theta that identifies these two spaces, uh, so if phi is a gamma invariant state on L infinity of gamma, 
So then uh, phi compose theta is gamma, well, sigma x trivially on the space, so it's gamma mod sigma invariant. Um, I don't think gamma and it's still a state. So if gamma is amenable, then any quotient group will also be amenable. So as a corollary, corollary of this, uh, every abelian group is the quotient of a free abelian group. And so the corollary is that all abelian groups are amenable. Uh, you can also ask about subgroups. So that's maybe the next proposition. And that's also, it uh, pre preserves this property. So if gamma is amenable and sigma is a subgroup of gamma, not necessarily normal, so then sigma is amenable. So the proof of this, well, we want to do a similar trick where we embed L infinity of the subgroup into L infinity of the whole group. Uh, one key difference between this is you don't have a natural identification of these two spaces like you do here. Uh, so there will be a non-canonical way to embed L infinity of the subgroup. Uh, so specifically, we're gonna have to choose some coset representatives. So let's let uh, T be a set of coset representatives. For uh, gamma, I guess the left cosets, the space of left cosets. Um, uh, oh, it just started snowing here. That's exciting. Uh, so the space of less cosets, so IE, uh, any element in gamma can be written as something in sigma times something in T. Uh, so then what you can do is we can then uh, get an embedding from this of L infinity and sigma to uh, L infinity of gamma. So we, we define, let me call it uh, maybe phi. So this is mapping L infinity of sigma to L infinity of gamma. And this is by V of F at some sigma times T is going to just be F and sigma. All right, so this gives us a, a map of these two spaces. Uh, it's pretty easy to see that this map is, I mean, it's a star uh, homomorphism. Um, and in particular, it preserves positivity. It's also equivariant. So since we took the, the right cosets here, it's equivariant with respect to the left action of sigma. So V is sigma equivariant. Um, and so what this means is again, we can uh, apply the, the invariant state on gamma and get an invariant state on sigma. So if, V in L infinity of gamma is a gamma invariant state. So then V impose uh, capital V or other font V is a sigma invariant state. So therefore, sigma is amenable. Uh, so uh, the other final remark I want to make about amenable groups, so the, what groups are amenable. So the other example is, of course, I should have mentioned this before, uh, all finite groups are amenable. So that's another large class of groups. Um, 
Okay, there's one more permanent proper property I want to prove about amenable groups, but before I do that, I want to give you a different characterization of amenable groups. In fact, in many books, this is how they're defined, uh, but we have the following theorem, and that is gamma of, or gamma group, the following are equivalent. One is that gamma is amenable. Two is that um, whenever gamma acts by homeomorphisms, on a compact house door space, uh, there exists an invariant probability measure. And the other condition three is that whenever gamma, uh, I'm gonna put up some preludes first. Uh, so if V is a locally convex topological vector space and K and V is a uh, non-empty compact convex subset and gamma X on K by continuous affine transformations, so then gamma has a fixed point. Uh, affine transformations, by that I just mean they preserve convex combinations. Uh, so these three things, so if you're familiar with Kakutani's, Kakutani's fixed point theorem, Kakutani's fixed point theorem is exactly the theorem that abelian groups uh, satisfy the uh, third condition. This is Kakutani's fixed point theorem. So in other words, Kakutani just rediscovered or found another way, actually I don't know the time frame. Uh, but Kakutani's fixed point theorem is exactly the statement that abelian groups are amenable. Uh, so let's go ahead and give a proof of this. The last condition, do you mean that uh, K has a fixed point? Or? Uh, that gamma has a fixed point in K. Or K has a fixed point of gamma, I guess, either way. Right. Right. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, give a proof of this. Uh, so one implication we've already done, and that is uh, that two implies two implies one. We've already done because we saw that uh, having a being amenable was equivalent to the action on the stone check compactification having an invariant measure, and that is an action by homeomorphisms on a compact house space. Um, so this is just the fact that the stone check compactification is compact house door. And having an invariant measure here is the same as having an invariant state on L infinity of gamma. So that's that implication we already show. Uh, to show the other implication, it's gonna be a similar thing where we just use the fact that the stone check compactification is kind of like the universal uh, compact Ausdorf space on which the group acts on. So specifically, suppose that we have gamma acting by homeomorphisms on K with K compact Hausdorff. And let's go ahead and fix some point K in K. I guess I didn't uh, write it, but uh, of course, acting by homeomorphism on compact house space, it should always be a non-empty set. 
people don't really think about the empty set as a compact Casper space. I don't know. I'll let you guys decide about that. But non-empty should be implicit when, when it's required. All right, so we'll assume that there exists some point k and k, and then we consider consider the map going from gamma to k, uh, defined by a map in element in gamma gets sent to t times k. And the thing to notice about this map is it's left equivariant. So if the group acts on itself on the left and the group acts on K and this map that we've defined here is equivariant with respect to that action. Uh, and then now what, what we can do is we can use the universal property of the stone check compactification. That says that if you have any map from gamma to a compact house door space, then there exists a continuous map from the stone check compactification into that compact house door state space, which extends it. So there exists some, uh, beta, uh, let me call it, I don't know, pi mapping beta gamma to k um, continuous such that pi of t is equal to tk for t and gamma. That's just using this universal property. Uh, and moreover, because this original map was equivariant, this map right here will also be equivariant. So this will be equivariant. That's because this is not just some map, but it's a unique map since gamma is dense inside a stone to check magnification. Uh, so therefore we get this equivariant map here. Well, if you're amenable, then there's an invariant probability here. And now we have this equivariant map. So now you can just push forward the measure. So the push forward of a gamma invariant probability measure on the stone check magnification gives a gamma invariant probability measure on K. All right, so that's how you can prove that implication. Uh, next, let me show you that two implies three. Uh, and for this, we just noticed that, well, if you have a compact convex subset of a locally compact locally convex topological vector space, then in particular, this is a compact Hausdorff space. Uh, so therefore, by condition two, there exists a, a probability, an invariant probability measure. So if mu is a probability measure on K is gamma invariant. And now we use the fact that any locally convex uh, com any convex compact subset of a locally convex topological vector space, we have this very center map mapping the space of probability measures down to the space K itself. If mu is gamma invariant, then the very center map of this is now in K itself and is uh, gamma invariant also. So it's a gamma fixed point. Uh, so if you haven't seen the Berry center map before, uh, so if it's, if mu is a finitely supported probability measure, then you just take the corresponding convex combination and then, and then you just use the fact that that map on finite probability measures extends because the finite probability measures is weak star dense in the space of probability measures. Um, so that's how you can prove it exists, but I'm not going to go into the, that detail. I'll let you guys look that up if you haven't seen the Berry center map. But it's just, it's a natural convex map from probability measures to K. All right, so conversely, how do you get from three back to two? Uh, and that's even easier because the space probability measures is itself a compact convex subset of a locally convex topological vector space. So 
specifically the probability space of probability measures on a compact Hausdorff space sits inside of the dual of continuous functions. It's the state space of the dual of continuous functions here. And this uh, is uh, compact convex and uh, so compact with the weak star topology. Uh, convex, uh, and that's all I need to say. All right, so if three is satisfied, then in particular for these spaces, there's a fixed point. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah, I have one. Sure. Uh, in, in the proof of uh, one implies two, say I'm not really used to the amenable definition, but mm -hmm. what gives us, uh, the existence of a gamma invariant probability measure on? Ah, yes. This, so this is, um, this is what I mentioned uh, at the end of class last time. Uh, over here is that we have this identification. So it's this part I mentioned right here. So we have this identification between L infinity of X and continuous functions on the stone check magnification. In fact, this is my preferred way of defining the stone check magnification as the Gelfand spectrum of L infinity of X. So that it gives you this. And then the Reese representation theorem says that states on continuous functions of this compact Hausdorff space are in bijective correspondence with probability measures on the space. So states okay. on L infinity of X, which is how we define amenability, are really is in bijective correspondence with measures on the stone check magnification. So, and I'm just using that identification. Does that answer okay, so after the last class, I looked up the definition of amenable, and I it actually said the um, the second definition. So at this point, uh, I'm not really I mean, sure what we're using as the definition. So the definition I'm using is right here, and this is how von Neumann defined it. This is von Neumann's original definition right here. So that's that's the definition I'm taking. However, I'm I'm using oh, okay. freely that we have these identifications here. And so this is equivalent to there being an equivariant or an invariant probability measure on the stone check magnification. All right, so I'm using, I, I'm using freely that this is equivalent to that statement. And that follows from the fact that you have this identification. Uh, now, now Kakutani's theorem, which says uh, is this, this is another way, this condition right here is one way you often see amenable groups defined and we just showed it was equivalent. And uh, here are the, the implications right here. But Thank the you. definition I gave is von Neumann's original definition that you'll find in his paper. Okay. The, the term amenability itself, so von Neumann wrote his paper in, in German. So the English word amenability, this was chosen by um, uh, Day. He chose this terminology. It's it's similar to von Neumann's German word for it, um, uh, but uh, it has the nice the nice thing that it's also uh, amenability or amenable groups. Uh, amenable is already spelled the same way as a as a different word in English, which is amenable, and that just means friendly. So these are think of these as friendly groups. They're nice. But amenable means it has a mean, so there exists a mean. So the groups are amenable, but the English word is amenable. Okay. Uh, so what was the point of that? So now I can prove the last property uh, that I wanna prove about amenable groups, the last permanent property. And that is that, uh, so if, Gamma is a group, and sigma is a normal subgroup of gamma. Uh, if sigma and gamma mod sigma are amenable, so then gamma is amenable. So amenable groups are preserved under extensions. Uh, an extension of an amenable group by an amenable group gives an amenable group. So let's give a proof of this. And for this proposition, it's a bit easier to use the, the characterization of every action on a probability space has an invariant measure. Uh, why is that? Well, let's go ahead and suppose 
that gamma X on K, and this is a compact house for space. And uh, so we want to find an invariant measure. Well, if we restrict the action to sigma, we know that sigma is an amenable group, and therefore there is an invariant measure there. So we can consider the space of all sigma invariant probability measures, the space of sigma invariant probability measures. But this space itself is also a compact. So this is uh, being sigma invariant is a closed condition. So this is a closed subset. And it's also a convex condition. If you take a convex combination of sigma invariant probability measures, you get another one. So this itself is a convex uh, compact uh, subset of a locally compact topological vector space. Moreover, we know that it is non-empty because sigma is amenable. And we have that the group gamma acts on this space since sigma is a normal subgroup and the group sigma acts trivially because of course they're fixed points. So it's the quotient group that acts. So then gamma mod sigma acts on the space of sigma invariant probability measures. And again, I've already mentioned this is uh, a compact convex non-empty subset of a locally compact topological vector space, specifically, again, the dual of CK. So now we can use amenability of gamma mod sigma to say that there must exist a fixed point in here. And then we just realize that that's exactly the fixed point for gamma. So since gamma mod sigma is amenable. There then exists a gamma fixed point in probability measure in sigma. All right. Any questions about that? So that finishes that group. And we already showed the other implications. So it's it's really the group is amenable if and only if uh, sigma and gamma mod sigma are amenable. So in particular, any group that you can build from starting with uh, abelian groups, uh, finite groups, uh, inductive limits, so inductive unions, uh, extensions, uh, anything else, uh, subgroups, and quotients. So all, any group you can construct in this way, these are all amenable. And these are called, this class of groups are called the elementary amenable groups. So this is a very nice, we've proved that the, all groups in this class are amenable. Uh, so for a long time, there was a question of do non-element, do amenable groups exist which are not elementary amenable? And the uh, answer is yes, there exists um, uh, non-amenable but not elementary amenable groups. Uh, the first person to produce such groups were it was Grigorchuk. So they're, you know, some somewhere outside of amenable. So we have amenable here. And they have Grigorchuk groups. Here. All right. Uh, so that's amenable groups. So so far, we haven't seen any examples of non-amenable groups, though, and that's the next thing I want to talk about. And there's a standard example of a non-amenable group, which is very easy to see, and that is free group on two generators. So, position the free group on two generators, let's say it's generated by A 
A and B is not unequal. And this is exactly what, uh, this is really what Hausdorff used in 1914 when he came up with the, what's called the Hausdorff paradox now, which is what Banach and Tarski uh, used to come up with the Banach-Tarski paradox. And, uh, and the proof of this is, is very geometric. It's really nice. Uh, so let me, I can almost just draw you the proof without words. Uh, so what I'm going to draw here is the Cayley graph of F2. So here's the origin. Uh, here's the point A. Here's the point B. We have B inverse down here. We have A inverse here. Here's A squared. Here's AB, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is the Cayley graph. So each each vertex of this graph. Uh, has an element of the free group. So I'm going to assume that, uh, you know, most of you are somewhat familiar with, say, the free group. Uh, so it's the set of words you can write in A, B, A inverse, B inverse with obvious um, reductions, but no relations. And it has this nice, uh, the Cayley graph has this nice representation as a tree. Okay, so what can we do with this Cayley graph? Well, there's some natural subsets of this Cayley graph, which I'm going to define for you here. So let me call this subset. That blue is a little harder to see. If I use the lighter blue, it's maybe a bit better. So that's the subset A plus. So it's all words which start with uh, a positive power of A. And I'll similarly define uh, say this subset here, this is B plus, all words that start with a positive power of B. And then I will also have B minus, and uh, we'll also have here A minus, all words that start with a negative power of A, and this. And so as I've drawn it, we naturally have the natural disjoint union, we can write F as a disjoint union of A plus, disjoint A minus, disjoint B plus, disjoint union B minus, and then we have just one element left over, the identity element. So it's a disjoint union of these five sets. Uh, but then uh, what happens if we uh, multiply, say, A a by a, or a plus by a on the uh, say a minus by a or what do I want to do? Yeah, let me do a minus, and we'll multiply by a on the left. So a minus was all things that started with a, a negative power of a. So we know that when we do this, we're going to get at least one cancellation, and uh, so we know that nothing here so we can't get a for instance because if we got a then that means the identity would have to be an a minus but we can get b because b is a times a inverse b so in fact what we're going to get is we're going to get graphically we're going to get this set right here and i can draw right here so this set is a times a minus so it's, we get every word that doesn't start with an A. If it doesn't start with an A, then we can write it as A times something that starts with an A inverse. Uh, so what I've drawn here is exactly that this is equal to this set that I've drawn here. So in particular, this union, um, union A plus is equal to the whole free group. It's also a disjoint union, but that's less important. And similarly, if I look at B times B minus union B plus, that's going to give us another way to write free groups. So these, this decomposition here, this is called a paradoxical decomposition.
because on one hand, we've written this set as a disjoint union of sets, but on the other hand, we've taken those disjoint unions, we've uh, retranslated them by equivalent sets, and now we've split it out, we've covered the space twice. And so we've sp we split the space in half, we split F2 in half, even with a little extra piece left over, we translated the pieces, and then we covered F2 twice. So that's a paradoxical decomposition. And having a paradoxical decomposition in particular means that the group is not amenable because we can see that right away. So if phi, if this were is, um, is a left invariant Uh, positive linear functional. So then what do we have? Well, we have that uh, phi of one, the constant one function. Well, this is just phi of the characteristic function a plus plus the characteristic function a minus plus b plus, plus B minus, plus, oh, plus the characteristic function on the singleton. But on the other hand, we saw with this, we can split up, this is linear, so we can uh, split this up and use that it's left invariant, so we can put translates in front of this. So this is V of one A plus, plus, and now here we have, uh, I guess, a times one a minus plus b one a plus plus one a. And then plus b. And now this, uh, Point right here, this so this we've just rewritten the identity, and this point right here, since it's a positive linear functional, this is non negative, so this is greater than or equal to, and now we have phi of one plus phi of one, which is phi of two. So, of course, if phi of one is equal is greater than or equal to phi of two, uh, this then implies that phi of one is equal to zero. So, this state there, uh, this positive linear function we have is actually the zero linear function. So i.e. phi is identically zero. So in particular, it's not a state. A state would give value one to one. Uh, so therefore, no such state exists. So that finishes the proof. Okay, so this is a very uh, nice proof uh, where you can see this completely geometrically why free groups are not amenable. Um, in particular, it's because if a subgroup, if a group is amenable, then any subgroup is amenable. So this means that any group that contains a free group is not amenable. So therefore, if a group gamma contains F2, then gamma is not amenable. Uh, and so then you could ask the question, well, what about groups which don't contain free groups, uh, non-elementary free groups? Are there uh, non-amenable groups which don't contain non-elementary free groups? And the answer is yes, there are, and, and there are quite a few of them now, um, some which are even fairly easy to prove. Uh, but uh, I don't think we'll give any examples in this semester just due to lack of time. Uh, but the first example was due uh, to Olshansky. Uh, so he has what he called Tarski monsters, which is a nice name for groups. Uh, so he showed uh, that they, these are groups. He produced such groups. He called them Tarski monsters, that they are non-amenable groups uh, but you can arrange them such that they're torsion, for instance. You can even you fix some 
uh, number p, some prime p in their group such that every element, um, the order of every element is a power of p or something like this. Uh, every, every proper subgroup is a cyclic p group. I think that's, that's how you do it. Um, so, the, so these are very strange groups, and yet he could show that they were still non-amenable. Uh, so that's, that's that. Um, if you haven't heard this before, there's also a well-known open problem relating to these groups, which is Thompson's group F. which is the group of piecewise linear uh, homomorphisms of the unit interval, such that each slope is a power of two. Uh, so this forms a countable, oh, and the, and the changes in slopes happen at dyadic rationals. Uh, so that forces this group to be a countable group. This is a nice countable group. Uh, it's known that this group does not contain a free group. It's also known that this group is not elementary amenable, but what's open is, is this group amenable or not? So let's open. Is F. So this is maybe the most well-known open problem regarding uh, groups which may or may not be amenable. Uh, there have been, I would say at least uh, four or five proofs by well-known mathematicians that it is either amenable or not amenable. And some, some proofs show it's amenable, some proofs show it's not amenable, and, and all of these eventually have a gap in them. So this is, think about this at your own risk. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, let's see, what else did I want to discuss about amenable groups? I forget, could the slopes be any rationals or? Uh, the, the slopes should all be powers of two for the Thompson group. Okay. Uh, let's see, the other thing. Uh, oh, one second. Sorry, yeah. did you say that uh, it's known that uh, F is not uh, elementary amenable? Yes, oh. and that's, that's just because its commutator subgroup is simple and uh, and so elementary amenable groups, uh, they, that can't happen. So. Um, okay, uh, so the other characterization of amenability, so we'll go through a few more characterizations on Friday, but one more I think I can squeeze in in the last two minutes. And that is that, so here's the definition. So if pi mapping gamma to unitary operators is a unitary representation, So then uh, the representation pi has almost invariant vectors. And that's what I'm defining. And that is that if there exists a sequence, or again, I probably I should say net to be precise uh, of unit vectors Cn uh, such that they become more and more invariant as n tends to infinity. Cn minus Cn goes to zero as n goes to infinity and this is for all t. So that's the definition of a uh, almost invariant uh, sequence or an almost invariant net. And um, uh, yeah, so here, let me write out the theorem that we'll prove on Friday. So I'll write it out so we can start on Friday. So here's the theorem. So again, the following are equivalent. One is gamma is amenable. Two is um, 
there exists a sequence mu n or net and probability measures on gamma such that uh, the they become more and more invariant as n goes to infinity for all t in gamma. Or here, uh, by this I mean, of course, gamma acts on itself by left multiplication, and hence it'll act on its press-based probability measures just by push forward. Uh, so this is a subset. My groups are always discrete, so this is a subset of L1 of gamma. This is called writer's condition. Uh, three is the left regular representation. Which we'll denote by lambda. So this is going to be gamma two unitary L2 gamma. Um, so this has almost invariant vectors. The left regular representation, uh, if, the, if you haven't seen this before, what I mean by this is just take the usual group multiplication and then just extend that to L2 of the group. Uh, so it's amenable, they're at L4. There exists a Fulmer sequence. So even though we saw that clearly the existence of a Fulmer sequence implied that the group was amenable, that's how we proved that abelian groups were amenable, it's actually the converse as well. If you're amenable, then there already exists a Fulmer sequence. Um, of course, finding that Fulmer sequence might be much more difficult in, in non-abelian groups. All right, so this is what we'll prove on Friday, and then maybe we'll also talk about uh, paradoxical decompositions a little bit more. Uh, so I'll go ahead and stop here. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes. Uh, the first condition is for a se sequence. It's, is it not net? Uh, yeah, I should say whenever I say sequence, uh, so you should always think maybe net. Uh, so um, I'll usually assume my groups are countable, in which case you can take sequences everywhere. Uh, but for uncountable groups, I should uh, maybe be precise and, and say nets. Uh, and again, this, this should be a net uh, here. Yeah, these, should, these should be nets rather than <laughs> Okay, thank you. Could you repeat the definition of an almost invariant vector again? Yeah, we have it right here. So an almost invariant vector is actually not a vector, it's actually a sequence of vectors. So it's a bit unfortunate, the, the terminology. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, but here's the definition right here. It just means you have a sequence of unit vectors. Unit means they have norm one. Uh, so these are unit vectors and they become more and more invariant uh, as tend to in, ten, n tends to infinity. So that's the definition of almost invariant. Actually, the equivalence of two and three here is uh, pretty straightforward, and, and you guys can think about that between now and Friday. But the other implications are, are not straightforward. At least there's an easy direction, hard direction for, for the others. All right, any other question? All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, stop here then. Oh, oh, actually, I have one more question, not sure. related to specific details. I was just wondering, because um, in Dr. Osen's seminar, we talked about the Gregor Chor group and some growth, some interesting growth properties of that group. And I was wondering if there's any reason that we suspect that it's interesting properties with regard to amenability. Is yeah, you can also, you can get implications about uh, growth of the group. Uh, so if you have polynomial growth, then that implies that you're, or sub-exponential growth, then that implies that you're amenable, um, for instance. Okay. 
And what about elementary amenable? Is that uh, you know I'm I'm less familiar with with that with what you what you get. Okay. So I don't want to make any statements that are verifiably false. Okay. Thanks. All right. Great.